Welcome, everybody. Thank you all for coming out on such a sunny day. My name is Betsy Conop. I'm the Public Programs Assistant here at the Portland Art Museum. I hope you've all had a chance to see the Italian Style exhibition. Um, this lecture is the third in a series of eight talks, um, each offering a new lens on Italian style and the, um, as well as our, our fashion scene locally. Um, later this month, on March 29th, we're hosting a talk and book signing with the author Meg Lukens Noonan on her fabulous book, The Coat Route. And on March 26th and April 2nd, we're hosting a conversation series on the past, present, and future of Portland fashion with Portland Monthly Fashion Editor Eden Dawn, Portland Mercury Fashion Editor Marjorie Skinner, along with local, um, local people from Portland's fashion scene. Be sure to check the calendar on our website for more details, and um, hopefully we'll see you there. Before introducing today's speaker, I want to take a minute to thank the exhibition's presenting sponsor, Nordstrom, as well as our lead exhibition sponsors, Joanne Lilly and Laura Meyer. Additionally, we'd like to acknowledge our lead exhibition series sponsors, the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation, the Meyer Memorial Trust, the Collins Foundation, and Prudence M. Miller. And two reminders, if everybody could silence their cell phones, that would be appreciated. And then also, we'll need to clear the auditorium by 3.30. Um, at 4.30 today, the Northwest Film Center is screening um, Roman Holiday as part of their Italian-style film series program. That um, series is free to members, so be sure to grab a Film Center program on your way out if you're curious. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce Portland writer Sean Levy. Sean is the author of seven books, including the New York Times bestseller, Rat Pack Confidential, Paul Newman, A Life, and his latest, De Niro, A Life. He was film critic for The Oregonian from 1997 to 2012, has been an editor at American Film and Box Office magazines, and has written for dozens of newspapers and film magazines in the US and the UK. Currently, he reviews movies for KGWTV, serves on the board of the not-for-profit not organization Operation Pitch Invasion, and is at work on a book about popular culture and high life in Rome in the decades after World War II. Please help me welcome Sean Levy. Thank you so much. Um, I, I was going to thank you for coming out on such a lovely day, but we've had so many of them, it hardly feels like a loss. So, but thank you for coming out, period. Um, I have, uh, as, as was mentioned, I'm working on a book about this subject, and the working title is Dolce Vita Confidential. It's the true story of the events of, am, am I talking to this mic well enough for folks? Yes. Um, it's the true story of the events that sort of culminate in the, this film, um, which is an amazing document. It's, it's, it's nearly a work of nonfiction seen through the lens of dream and cinema um, by a series of people who were living the events as they were filming them and as they were writing about them. Um, and I want to walk you through the reality of that time and the creation of this work of art not only the poster, which someday I wish to own, um, but the, the film itself, which is, Bill, is, is this film in the series? Of course it is. Um, so if you've not seen it in some time or never seen it, I commend it to you highly. Um, I'm going to take it as, as a, a given throughout this talk that everyone is wearing fabulous clothes. Um, <laughs> fashion is one of the very often in popular culture, it's one of the harbinger uh, arts that ushers in a new age. Um, when you think of the swinging 60s in England, you had mini skirts and Vidal Sassoon before you had the Beatles. When you think of punk rock, you had Vivian Westwood and Malcolm McLaren designing ripped up and then um, uh, safety pinned together shirts on the King's Road. The Sex Pistols were formed as a band to promote the shop. So in popular culture, particularly starting in this post-war period, fashion is one of the first signals. And the uh, exhibit that we're celebrating um, takes us from the fascist regulation of the fashion industry through the modern era, but particularly this, this 
post-war era um, that I'll be talking about today. So I won't talk as much about fashion as I might. I'll throw stuff in, but I pulled out all the slides that I had originally chosen to emphasize that. But again, look around at people and you'll see they're, they're really well dressed. Um, I just want to grab a piece of paper. So today we're going to get to this film eventually, and we're going to follow Italy through a story that can be told in three pictures from three different films. This one, anyone know it? Bicycle. The Bicycle Thief, or Ladri di Biciclette. Roman Holiday, or as they call it, Vacanze Romane. And La Dolce Vita. <laughs> now, look at what's going on here. In technology, in clothing, in subject matter, in attitude. A boy and his dad, and the bicycle that means everything to a family. A few years later, there's some money in the air, nice suit, an American journalist, got a Vespa, that was a new thing. And now, it's Rome. They're used to this kind of party. You know, it's been going on there for about 3,000 years. Um, we're going to pick up the story of how something like this entered the mind of a filmmaker like Fellini um, in the late 40s. And we're going to start with fashion, as I mentioned, and cinema. And the event that I'm going to show you here, this is the wedding of Tyrone Power and Linda Christian in 1949 at a very little noted church actually inside the Roman Forum. You see the bridal couple on the staircase on the left side of the screen. Linda is wearing a gown made for her by the Fontana sisters. The three, um, Zoe, Micole, and Giovanna Fontana, who were really the first internationally celebrated couturists to come out of Italy after the war. Um, I draw your attention to this for a couple of reasons. Tyrone Power was in Rome making a film, Prince of Foxes, about the Borgias with Orson Welles as the Borgia Pope. Um, Linda Christian, the young starlet who uh, he married, um, she would, after this short-lived marriage, stay on in Rome and become part of the Dolce Vita scene. But look over there in the bottom left-hand corner. That's it. That's the photographers. Look at this crowd of people. This was an event that showed up in newspapers in Portland and Los Angeles and London and Tokyo. But there's hardly any press there. That would change as we go forward. So that's, that's a thread you want to keep in mind. A second thread you want to keep in mind is Cinecittà. 1937, Benito Mussolini built the largest film studio in Europe, Cinecittà, Cinema City. Uh, it was the last stop on the trolley line that went southwest out of the city. And Mussolini himself was there on the opening day to inaugurate it, cut the ribbon, you know, shoot somebody, I don't know what he did. Um, and, uh, the, 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 the uh, slogan there is, Cin cinema is the most powerful weapon. Um, so this was, this was seen as a tool of the state. Mussolini regulated, ironically, the fashion industry and it helped Italian couture and then Italian fashion as, a, as, as brands. He helped that rise, ironically, by regulating it. And he did the same thing for the cinema. And both of these became international symbols of Italy and the resurgence of Italy after the war. Um, that took a while, though, because during the war, Cinecittà, this is the actual studios, was a refugee camp. Um, literally used by that. The Germans eventually took a lot of the hardware out of the place, but they left this building intact, and the Allies never bombed it. So at the end of the war, they still had a movie studio in Rome. In fact, the largest industrial concern in Rome was a movie studio, and that was the case throughout this period. Um, and it had a history of producing gr grand epics celebrating the Roman Empire as a tool of fascism to show how great Italy once was and would always be. But that's not how the Italian movie business recovered from the war. First, you had movies like this, a quasi-documentary film by Roberto Rossellini, Rome Open City. Um, 
parts of which were filmed during the Nazi occupation of Rome and were incorporated into scenes being acted by Anna Magnani and Aldo Fabrizi. Um, and it inaugurated around the world an appreciation of a style that used non-actors, real locations, and stories of human struggle and poverty, the style known as neorealism. And one of the great things about neorealist directors and, and studios is they were very collaborative. So you wind up with like five screenwriters on a film like this, and two of them wind up being Michelangelo Antonioni and Federico Fellini. It was a very, very collaborative and not at all um, regimented like the American movie studios. It was very fluid. Um, and this was a golden age of Italian cinema. The first Oscar for a best foreign language film went to Bicycle Thieves, Ladri di Biciclete. The third one went to Shoeshine. And these, again, were films shot in Rome. You can go today, the sets still look like they do in, in this film. I, I just spent a month in Rome doing this sort of work, walking around with images of films. And, you know, it's Rome. Things don't change in a hurry. Um, and that's a great benefit to see contemporary history is now one of the layers that's on top of the Etruscan and you know, Imperial Roman and Papal Rome and Black Shirt Rome. And now we have the Dolce Vita Rome on top of that. Um, as Italy was making a name for itself as, as a cinematic uh, font after the war, um, a funny thing happened to the Hollywood film business. Of course, Hollywood after the war recovered very big. Even the threat of television didn't uh, stop it from being the most popular me you know, uh, entertainment medium in the world. Hollywood movies went everywhere. And as part of the Marshall Plan, um, the US government arranged with uh, the authorities in a few key European countries for a phenomenon that we refer to as locked funds. The money that MGM made in Italy had to stay in Italy. Paramount, Warner Brothers, RKO, all those companies had money piling up in Europe and no way to spend it. Then someone got the idea, why don't we make movies there? They have these wonderful sets. In Rome, they have this gigantic studio. We can make movies in Italy and make a kind of movie that we can't make here because we don't have a hundred acre lot the way they do in Rome. So um, starting in 1950, American money started pouring into the Roman film business. And you get, you know, it's just, it's a modern world. Um, <laughs> the, first, uh, the first big production um, was in 1950, Mervyn Leroy's Quo Vadis. Um, and you see what they're selling here, <laughs> you know? It's like this ancient Roman sex and violence and lurid and juicy and big. You know, the Italians made um, big epic films in the silent era when only one American director was doing it. They had it as an assembly line product. Um, and you had then, um, Another curious phenomenon, once people from Hollywood started coming over to Rome and finding that there was work, they stayed. So on Quo Vadis, there were hardly any Italians used except for extras. MGM sent over, this is MGM, yeah. MGM sent over technicians, cameramen, electricians, most of the, there's one speaking actor in this film who's Italian. Um, but they saw that there was a basic competence there and they didn't have to do that. They didn't have to send everyone to Italy. Um, they could use Italian crews. They also discovered that the Italian crews were good enough to do stuff other than this, so they started making smaller films. I love this poster with the map. You know, and again, there, Audrey Hepburn is still a beloved figure in Italy. Um, she made her home in Rome for many years and um, there are books around that you can get of uh, showing you Audrey's, Audrey's Rome, and it shows a cafe that might be in this movie or, or uh, a place she liked to shop or, or a park she, she frequented. Um, she wasn't the only one, Ava Gardner, Barefoot Contessa. This film was made in Rome. Um, she was dressed by the Fontana sisters who dressed Linda Christian for her wedding. Some of the dresses that 
uh, were made for the Barefoot Contessa inspired the Oscar-winning costumes in La Dolce Vita. Like, you can see the line directly. The black dress that Anita Ekberg wore into the Trevi Fountain, for instance, or the, um, the cassock-looking dress that she wore during the scene where she and the journalist climbed to the top of St. Peter's Cathedral, a Fontana sisters knockoff. But they made colossal films. And even though there was this second industry in Rome, this was what they were best at. Huge pictures. This picture would win 11 Oscars, uh, a record only equaled, what, four decades later by Titanic. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it, it's the sort of picture you can only make in Rome. Um, you could make it in the United States, but you would have to spend 10 times the money. Today in Cinecittà, there's still a set of the Roman Forum. And if you wanted to make a movie set in, in that period, you, you don't need to build anything. You just show up there. They still have one of the largest water tanks in any uh, film studio in the world. So it's still a very vital um, concern. You know, some of the pictures shot there recently, Gangs of New York, um, you know, they, they, they use the old New York streets that can serve as London or Paris. Um, um, the uh, HBO series Rome was shot there. Um, most of the biblical films that have been out since The Passion of the Christ, which was shot there, um, have been made at Cinecittà. So it's still very busy, and it's a stop on the subway now. The tram is gone, and there's one stop past it, but you can get on the subway in central Rome and get out at Cinecittà, and you're right at the front gate. It's crazy. So we have a movie business going. And when you have a movie business, of course, you have movie people, and they're hanging around. As you know, movies take a long time to film, and there's downtime. And you have people like Charlton Heston, and Jack Hawkins, and Stephen Boyd, and Sam Jaffe hanging around Rome. And who doesn't want to hang around Rome? The dollar is strong. Rome is charming. We're at peace. They've got these great clothes. You never eat better. The weather's nice. You're outside. The, um, the purview of Hollywood. You're not under the thumb of Jack Warner or Louis Meyer if you're staying at the Hotel Excelsior on the Via Veneto. You're kind of free, aren't you? Well, there was a third phenomenon. So we've got fashion, we've got film, and then we've got scandal. And the particular Italian flavor of scandal 1953, a body is found on the beach in Ostia. This is a drawing, of course. Um, the Ostia, the seaport of, of Rome. And this is a young girl named Wilma Montesi. Uh, no special background. She doesn't work in show business. Her family are shopkeepers. Um, she wasn't educated. She wasn't wealthy. She had a fiance who was a policeman from a little town near Naples whom she saw once or twice a year. Um, ordinary girl, she shows up dead, no explanation. Why was she there? How did she die? This mystery percolated in Italy for about eight years. It was their O.J. Simpson case. It was their um, birth, birth of the tabloid case. Remember that wedding? Just four years before this, um, no photographers, hardly at all. But then a funny thing happened. This case, the Montesi case, created a thirst in the media for images of the shady people around her. Word started to circulate that she had been at an upper-class drug and sex orgy at a hunting lodge on the coast, and the body had been dumped there. There was a fake count from Sicily, and a jazz musician whose father was a leader of one of the political parties in the coalition government. Um, there were all these rumors. People started showing up in the press. Alida Valley, the great actress, turned out to be dating someone who was allegedly at this party. She had to answer to the press. Um, People were being photographed in restaurants and outside their, their homes by these kid photographers who would come up to them on scooters, take a couple of shots and then fly away, and they get a hundred bucks or ten bucks from a newspaper for a picture of someone, Uncle, Uncle, um, ah, what was his name? 
her uncle was a character. He had like five mistresses and uh, there came a phrase, I'm gonna call him Fredo, and every, the phrase was everyone in Italy has an uncle Fredo. Um, so these non-entity people, these people who would become famous for being famous briefly because of an obscure connection to an obscure case, suddenly there's a phenomenon, there's a market for photos. And what used to be a quiet scene of one or two photographers showing up at a, an event developed a new culture. A whole bunch of photographers started showing up. They started showing up a lot on a street called the Via Veneto, not a very remarkable street in Rome. It was built in the 19th century, so it's new by, by Roman, you know, Roman standards. Um, and it connects uh, the Piazza Barberini with uh, the Aurelian Wall. Um, the most notable edifices on the street, on the lower end, there's the Capuchin Monastery where the basement is filled with the bones of thousands of monks used as architectural ornaments and uh, sculptural pieces. Anyone seen that? Surely, yeah, that's, that's a famous site. And the next thing up the street is the American Embassy. Um, and then up the street from that, there were these high-end hotels and a couple of pricey cafes that no Romans went to. But these guys went there. These are, I don't know, this is kind of like the Algonquin Round Table of Rome, circa 1950. These are the witty writers, um, the intellectuals, the novelists, the poet. Uh, Giuseppe Ungaretti is the bald guy, um, second bald guy on the left. The first bald guy on the left is Vincento Cardellini, who was uh, hilariously described by a friend as Italy's greatest dying poet. Um, <laughs> And they used to frequent the Via Veneto. And there were a couple of cafes that they would meet in for a cup of coffee or a drink, the way, the way screenwriters meet at the farmer's market in LA. It was, it was not a special place, it was just a stop. But it drew people. People like, oh, you know, that's, that's the hip spot. You know, it was the 50s, there were two spots to hang out in Rome. The Via Marguta, which is where the artists hung out, that was like the Greenwich Village, and the Via Veneto where the intellectuals hung out. There were nightclubs, there were a couple of expensive hotels, but during the 50s, as the movie people came in and started using those hotels, a scene developed on this street. The man standing here is a Roman named Tazio Secchiarello, and he uh, was one of those kids who would show up when an American serviceman was having his picture taken, or, or was standing in front of St. Peter's Basilica or the Colosseum and say, mister, take your picture. This was in an era when people didn't travel with high definition cameras in their pockets. And you know, to have your picture taken in front of the Roman Colosseum and sent back home, that would be quite a, quite a treat. And these little kids worked for photographers and they were called scatini and they would get the business, the photographer would shoot you, they'd give you a ticket and you'd go by the photographers the next day and you'd get your picture. He grew up around photographs, around cameras, and around hustling. Good Roman, un furbo, you know, a, 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 a furbo in Rome, it's like telling someone, shame on you, but good on you for having beat me. <laughs> you know, it's like you're clever and you beat me, but I admire your cleverness. I'll get you next time, but you know, props to you for this one. Um, he was a guy like that. Not, not dishonest, but you know, clever. He would catch people. And he started hanging around the Via Veneto with a couple of other guys because they found that Ava Gardner partied late into the night with different men. Um, you know, you could be on friendly terms with an actress, like Anna Magnani, and she would sit and pose for you. Or you could rile somebody up. That's our friend Tazio Secchiaroli again. Um, that's the actor Walter Chiari, who in fact was out on the town with Ava Gardner on this particular night. Um, some of these people got really angry. Um, Anita Ekberg. <laughs> I love it, it's Diana, right? It's, it, I mean, this is happening in Rome. Think about this. This probably happened in Rome in the year 50 also. Um, so this was a new thing. Nobody had ever seen this in the media. Italian weekly magazines started popping up filled with pictures of 
you know, King Farouk out partying, Orson Welles buying a newspaper, um, Ava Gardner out with uh, Tony Franciosa, both of them married to different people, another fisticuff scene in the street. Anita Ekberg's first husband, Anthony Steele, was wonderful. He was lunk-headed and alcoholic. And every time these photographers showed up, he would, I'll get you. So there's like a series. You could do a flip book of this guy stumbling in the streets of Rome at night. Um, and, and this was a thing. Nobody in Hollywood was used to this because within the, um, you know, anyone know what TMZ stands for? You know, the, the sleaze merchant, uh, web and TV series of, of you know, gossip and sort of tabloid stuff. Does anyone know the acronym? No? 30 Mile Zone. It was an unspoken agreement between the studios and the media for a long time that anything within 30 miles of the corner of Sunset and Vine, you didn't shoot it. If it wasn't legit, if the stars didn't want to be seen in that light, you let them be. There were no people door stopping them, waiting outside their hotels, trying to catch them at three in the morning coming out of Ciro's with someone they weren't married to. Didn't happen. They had a gentleman's agreement. Gentlemen. Um, this was well outside the 30 mile zone. And they had no agreement with the Italian press. And no one had ever seen anything like this before. There wasn't even a name for these guys. They started calling them assault photographers. Assault photographers. Um, in 1958, now all of this is percolating. You know, wonderful clothes, she looks great, he looks great, whoever he is. Um, movies, movie stars, American stars, big movie industry in Italy, these photographers. You also had a resurgent Italian economy. The Marshall Plan had worked. Um, it, Italian people referred to the period from 58 to 64 as il boom. You know, the, the Italian miracle. Um, and, and this is now a town filled with money. They're rebuilding all the places that were bombed out in the, in the 60s, uh, in the war, are being built in the, in the late 50s, early 60s. They, they sort of look like housing projects now. Uh, council blocks, they call them in, in England. Um, we had housing projects in the USA at, at around this time. Um, but that, you do business like that in Italy. <laughs> I mean, the, the amount of corruption, graft, insider trade, I mean, you know, of course a miracle like this is going to be corrupt from the inside out, from the top to the bottom. Um, more on which in a moment. 1958, it all comes to a, uh, a boil. On one single night on the Via Veneto, Tazio Seccheroli, is threatened by the bodyguards to King Farouk, is chased by Anthony Franciosa, who's escorting Ava Gardner, and catches Ava Gard uh, Anita Ekberg and Anthony Steele at some club, and you know, come at you. So he gets like a triple scoop. And he literally became headline news for the famous night in August, the Ferragosto, the night of Ferragosto, the, the holiday when everyone in Rome goes to the shore. Um, then, Two months later, there was a birthday party for a Swiss, uh, young Swiss noblewoman who was trying to become a movie star. She was engaged to a, uh, a Vanderbilt, an American Vanderbilt. And she threw a party for herself in Trastevere at a bohemian restaurant. And in the midst of the party, a uh, Turkish actress who later claimed that she was given a funny cigarette to smoke did a striptease in front of the nobility, in front of, you know, these, these are like politicians' sons up here. Um, these are like, you know, uh, 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 commendatore, you know, people with like six surnames, these young guys. And the scene is very big, and you see all these elegantly dressed people, and this, this gal just partying. Um, <laughs> and this, this is now, like, people start talking about Rome a few years before, it had by like, eat your soup, honey, there are children starving in Europe, to Rome being like the Rome of the late Caesars, you know, or the, the really nasty Borgias. I mean, the, the idea of the Latin lover, of Mediterranean sensuality, things that have always been in Western culture really were exemplified. You started getting also late in the 50s movies where Americans 
American women would come to Italy and be preyed upon. Three coins in the fountain, the Roman spring of Mrs. Stone's, Termini Station. That's a little earlier, but that, that genre where the predatory Latin male threatens the, the chaste Western northern woman. Um, so all of this comes to uh, the attention, how can it not, of Federico Fellini. He lives in the midst of this. Um, he lives in Via Marguta, the Greenwich village part of Rome, but of course he knows those guys who are sitting around the table, um, the intellectuals, and he reads the newspapers. He's also won, by 1958, not one Best, Best Foreign Film Oscar, but two. In fact, he won four. He won every time he was nominated. Um, so he gets the idea to make a movie about an intellectual who comes to, the, to Rome to have a great career as a man of letters and becomes part of the Roman scene, the orgy at Rugantino restaurant, um, the movie stars, these assault photographers. That's what he wants to make a movie about. And it takes him about a year, year and a half to write. Here he is. He hates the Via Veneto. He, he always hated going up there, and especially later. Um, this is a press event for the film that followed. Uh, he did a, a spoof of censors in a, an anthology film called Boccaccio 70. And this is a publicity shot for that. And he looks really happy to be on that street. And the end of the street is now named for him. Um, so right about where he's standing, there's a sign that says, you know, Largo Fellini. And this little traffic circle is named for him. But this is the film, of course, that he makes. OK. I'm going to talk now about the making of this film. But I want to stop and, and um, catch some questions from you. People who've seen any of the films that I've talked about mentioned so far. I'm going to make you really jealous. Uh-oh. Incredible, incredible, well done. <laughs> okay, anyone top being on the set of Quo Vadis? <laughs> Usually you meet the people who you need to interview about your book after it's been published, so this is good. Um, there were a couple other hands over here, no? And we do have microphones, um, ah. which are helpful, so we, we can catch here's, everyone. Here's a hand. Where does Stromboli fit in, the Rossellini movie? Is that later? Which? Stromboli? Well, Rossellini is a special case here. After he made his neorealist films, he made three films about the end of the war, um, Open City, Paisan, and Germany, Year Zero. And then he, um, a, a scandal that you could see but didn't quite bubble up the same way was his relationship with Ingrid Bergman. She acted for him in Stromboli, replacing Anna Magnani. They were both married. They had children out of wedlock. They had a child, Robertino, out of wedlock. And um, the, if, they had, if that had happened eight years later, they would have been pilloried in the media. But the media hadn't quite gotten there. And by the time this happened, Rossellini was sort of passe. He was doing his own thing and still making great films, but he was not au courant the way he had been 10 years prior. Um, but this is, you know, we're, we're talking about a period when the Italian cinema has Lucchino Visconti, Vittorio De Sica, Roberto Rossellini, the younger directors, Fellini, Antonioni, Pasolini. All of these people were working in Italian cinema throughout the 50s. This is one of the most fertile periods any national cinema has ever experienced. Hollywood had nothing on that, and they couldn't make the big movies like Ben-Hur in Hollywood. They had to go to Italy. So think about that. If there were a place now that not only was busier and better than Hollywood, but also bigger, and Hollywood had to go there to make their movies. It's unimaginable now, but this really happened. Um, so we'll talk a little about uh, the making of, of La Dolce Vita. Um, Fellini gets the idea um, to, to tell the story of a fallen intellectual. And people have seen The Great Beauty, yes? Which won the Oscar two years ago, the Italian film, yes? People? Oh my gosh. I commend to you uh, La Grande Bellezza, um, uh, just, just an extraordinarily beautiful film that tells a very similar story, 
but it's modern. And um, uh, in many ways, it's as if this character, Marcello Rubini, had progressed 30, 40 years, and we see the, the latter part of his life in contemporary Rome. Um, but this was the idea. The thing was, the character of the photographer and the phenomenon of the photographer kept getting louder and louder in his head. And as he was writing, and as he was, he, he always wrote collaboratively. This film had a, at least four authors, um, two of which won the Italian equivalent of the Pulitzer for fiction. Um, you know, the, 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 the collaborative rapport between all the arts in Italy at this time is extraordinary. Excuse me. Um, he starts thinking more about this, this photographer. And actually, I have a different thing first. This is the set of La Dolce Vita. You look at that film and you're like, wow, wow, I'm right on the Via Veneto. Actually not. <laughs> you're on a set of the Via Veneto built according to Fellini's specifications at Cinecittà Teatro V, Cinque. And um, it's bigger. <laughs> and there's no traffic. They did do some exterior shooting, and Fellini loved to tell a story about how they went around a block about eight times, and there was a little elegantly dressed man on the corner. And every time Fellini came by in the camera car, the guy would shout obscenities at him. <laughs> um, but so this was safer for a number of reasons. And partly, you know, recall that he's writing about events as they're happening. So if someone is playing a, an egghead intellectual in this movie, or a, a countess with a taste for cocaine, or a movie producer with two mistresses, probably that person is on the Via Veneto that night. He's taking characters from real life, he's changing them. There are episodes in the film that, um, the famous episode of the uh, fake sighting of the Madonna. Um, that was based on reporting by Tazio Secchiaroli. He didn't only photograph celebrities, he was an actual photojournalist, and he covered fires, and he covered protests, and he covered this sighting of the Madonna in an olive tree in one of the new slums of Rome, which turned out to be a, a sham, of course. And um, Fellini incorporated that episode. So it wasn't only the high life. He rebuilt the, the Via Veneto because he didn't want to shoot there, and he took the phenomenon of the assault photographers and he made it huge. Um, these guys show up throughout La Dolce Vita. They're, they're there all the time. And um, one of them is the sidekick of our main character. Our main character, played by Marcello Mastroianni, has one photographer who he works with and the character's name came from a travel journal from the English novelist George Gissing, who in the early 1900s, 1800s, stayed at a boarding house in Livorno run by a man named Paparazzo. And one of the collaborators on this film, and there's always been a debate as to which, came across that name and Fellini loved it. It sounded like a fly buzzing. And he thought, we're gonna call this photographer Paparazzo. And literally, the word had not been used before this. Um, I did a word search in the New York Times. This is, this is the things you do to not write. Um, <laughs> I looked for the first instance in the New York Times of the word paparazzo, and it was a murder case in 1930 in Jersey City. Uh, and it turned out the dead guy wasn't paparazzo, but that's who they thought he was at first. So, um, the photographers, by the way, hated this name. Um, they, you know, many of them thought of themselves as photojournalists, and some of these guys had covered the war, some of the older ones. Um, so they, 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 you know, this was how they made their living. They were working for great newspapers, you know, uh, La Repubblica, Il Messaggero, um, Corriere della Sera. They, they, they were working for the, 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 the height of the Italian press, and, you know, it was an era where um, the newsreel was happening, but it wasn't happening like this. I also, I wish I, I had been clever enough to, to save that Linda Christian picture because the, the cameras are different. The flash attachments are different and the cameras are different. In the 10 years, and this might be why Rossellini got off easy, the cameras had changed so that you could be more portable, faster. You could assault. You could run up, flash, and run away before anyone saw you. 
And that becomes an important uh, element to what these guys do to this day. The technology always changes. Um, so Fellini invents this band of characters based on a real phenomenon. And that becomes a real phenomenon. It's one of these things where it was based on reality and art made it an even bigger reality. Um, we still have this phenomenon. One of the great uh, fonts of history on paparazzi was that era after um, Diana Spencer died in the car accident in Paris. There were all these heavy pieces about the role of the paparazzi in this uh, tragedy. And it was at a time when a lot of these guys were still alive, so some of the last interviews they ever gave were talking about how they got started in light of the death of Diana Spencer. <clears throat> this, this is um, one of the most famous films ever made. Um, the, one of the most famous kisses in cinema history. This is in the Trevi Fountain. There had been at least two real episodes of people waiting at night in the Trevi Fountain, including one of Anita Ekberg herself. Um, that's how this wound up in the film. Fellini, again, stealing from the headlines. The first time Fellini saw Anita Ekberg was in a, a, an advertisement in a magazine. And he handed the magazine back to someone and said, my god, don't let me meet her. <laughs> <coughs> You know, and in many ways, this is, this is the romantic image that we have of Italy in the 50s, you know. Think back to Audrey and Gregory Peck on that scooter. She's a kid. She's a princess. He's an American journalist. He's in it for the story. And there's no relationship between them. She sleeps at his house in his pajamas. There was nothing sexual in that room. If you stay and see it later today, I think you'll agree. You know, it's not even like metaphoric pajamas and a metaphor, you know, like in a, it happened one night with the Great Wall of Jericho. No, no. This is, this is a young girl in pajamas because, you know, that was what there was to wear. This, on the other hand, is Botticelli come to life in, in beautiful black and white photography. I mean, no. You know, the, the, the Venus rising in the water, Marcello, Marcello, you know, and um, th this woman, the light, they shot this at night, you know, there's, there's wonderful set photos of Anita in her waders going into the <laughs> ice cold water in the Trevi Fountain, and um, Fellini talking to her while she's bunched up in like four furs. Um, there's a film by Ettore Scola called We All Loved Each Other So Much that tells the story of three friends who fought in the war together, and it follows them through the mid-70s when the film was made. And there's a scene in that film when one of them's an ambulance driver, and he's driving through Rome, and he has to stop because they're making a movie at the Trevi Fountain. It's the late 50s in this narrative. And he sees a friend of his who wanted to be an actress, and she's sitting there, and she's being talked to by a guy in wraparound glasses. And you see it, and you say, that guy looks just like Marcello Mastroianni. This is very clever. They've incorporated La Dolce Vita into this film by showing a guy who looks like Marcello Mastroianni. And then there's dialogue between the, our characters, the ambulance driver and the girl who wanted to be in movies. And when the girl turns back, she says, tell me again, Mr. Mastroianni. And he starts talking, and you look at him, and you say, you know, now that the camera's on him longer, I think that is Mastroianni. And then you see in the background a guy with one of those Borsellino hats and the big scarf and overcoat, and he's ordering everyone around in that nasal voice. Oh, look, they found a Fellini look-alike. Well, it is Fellini, and it is Mastroianni, in 1974, playing themselves in 1959 <laughs> in a film within a film, within a film within a film. Um, but this is the scene, because this is, you know, one of, you go to Rome and you go into tourist shops, you will see many images of Pope Francis, who is beloved, and John Paul II, who is beloved, and you will see pictures, you know, little snow globes of the Colosseum, and you, and you will also see Audrey Hepburn and Gregory Peck on a scooter, and you will see Marcello Mastroianni and Anita Ekberg in the Trevi Fountain. This has become as famous an image of Rome as there ever has been, and uh, more people would have seen it, technically, then would have seen the Colosseum during the age of the Caesars. It's crazy. John Lennon got nearly crucified for talking like that, but you know, technology has changed and it's allowed us to spread images in a way that was never possible um, in, in, in the days of, of uh, antiquity when it would take months to hear about something like a change of government. 
So we have, you know, it's, it's glorious. It's, it's, it's this beautiful kiss. It's one of the most romantic scenes in movie history. It's, it's uh, the culmination, the, the apex uh, of, of the Roman high life, um, of, of the journalist. Remember, this guy's, a, this guy's a, a gossip columnist, and he's in the Trevi Fountain with the Swedish actress. Um, it's, 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 mm, but it's not, is it? At the end of the film, our protagonist has gone through virtually the entire cycle of you know, crescence and decay that the ancient Roman culture went and the papal Roman culture went. And at the end, he's spent all night at an orgy in which a woman dances just like that Turkish dancer I showed you earlier. Again, ripped from the headlines. And everyone leaves the orgy to walk on the beach um, and they find this creature and they just stare at it. And it's clearly a metaphor for them, you know, and what's become of their soul. And, you know, Mastroianni is, is a great self-deprecating, you know, Paul Newman looks, but, you know, hard on himself in a way that um, doesn't feel forced. He's, he's very good at, at, at playing down from his potential glamour. And here, you know, with his eyes darkened and with a white suit and a black shirt, you know, he really looks the part of the, the jaded Rue. But everyone in Italy in 1960, when they saw this, saw that. This is their white Bronco chase. It's amazing. It's not, it's not even made up. I mean, you know... Um, they didn't, they didn't have pictures of Wanda Montesi on the beach. They recreated them, but um, th this, this is uh, what they built from. Now, it's one thing for a work of art to say, you are all rotten in your souls. You are all you know, staring at this creature. Um, you are all fallen. You know, this thing we're celebrating is, 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 is venal and you know, corrosive. It's another thing to actually make people believe that. You know, you can say that in an art movie, you can't say it at a political convention. And Rome doesn't lose the plot. You know, the, the, the pop culture sometimes moves like a bouncing ball. And it was in Italy in these years. This was where if you wanted movies, if you wanted fashion, if you wanted a certain type of sophisticated music, night out, you know, if you wanted style, you, you took a little from the, the, the Romans. Um, there's a wonderful episode of Mad Men when uh, Don Draper and, and, and Betty, his wife, go to Rome, and it's around this time, 1960, and it's like very elegant, and it's, it's the place. And it remained that way. Um, you know, this is 1960, 1963, biggest movie ever made. Shot in Rome, just like Fellini built the Via Veneto at Cinecittà, only bigger. 20th Century Fox built the Roman Forum at Cinecittà, only bigger. Um, they built the Roman harbor at Ostia, up the beach from Ostia, bigger. Um, and uh, everything was big about this, um, including the scandal. Um, again, the stars both married to different people. There's charming pictures of Elizabeth Taylor um, making the scene on the Via Veneto about two years earlier with Eddie Fisher. Richard Burton married to Sybil. Um, they meet on this film and uh, paparazzi. Guess what they just got from Japan? Telephoto lenses. It's a completely different world, you know? And um, it's a world that doesn't quite mesh any longer. 1963, when this film comes out, um, it's the most costly film made in Hollywood up to that time. Um, people know Century City in West Los Angeles, the two towers and that um, avenue of stars and the big theaters over there. That used to be the 20th century backlot, which had to be sold off after the production expenses on Cleopatra, which by the way made money, but not quick enough. Um, it was the top box office film of its year and it was still a catastrophic disaster financially. Um, and it presented a culture that by now 
was, you know, global. This, this scandal went everywhere for years. Um, the first use of the word paparazzo in the New York Times was an article about Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. Um, but it didn't have quite the same air to it. When this film premiered at the Ziegfeld Theater in New York City in 1963, on that same day, that same day in London, uh, the Beatles released their first EP. Um, and the one thing that I haven't mentioned, talking about Roman Italian popular culture in the 50s, is the one thing that changed the world. Kids, youth culture, rock and roll. 1963, rock and roll was kind of still under wraps. There had been a boom in the 50s, but since then Elvis had gone into the army and become a B-movie actor. Buddy Holly was dead. Little Richard had quit to join the ministry. Jerry Lee Lewis married you know, an, his embryo cousin. Um, <laughs> Chuck Berry went to jail for uh, uh, a, a violation of the Mann Act. So you know, there was certainly rock and roll music at this time, but it was very bland. You know, Motown was starting up. The Beach Boys were starting up, but there was nothing that we associated with that wild teen energy that spawned Blackboard Jungle just a few years earlier. The Beatles clearly changed that. And since that, time, that night they premiered on the Ed Sullivan Show in February 1964, the kids, the kids have the center stage. Adults have never gotten it back. I mean, you know, a lot of this story is concurrent with the uh, heyday of Frank Sinatra, one of the biggest stars who ever was. And he gets wiped out by the Beatles. Um, they, they, he still has an audience, he's just playing not to the main room anymore. Um, and the main room has been dominated by Youth, youth culture, people seeming more youthful, more casual dress, more casual manners, more casual um, uh, social and, and cultural institutions. You know, we, we've changed. And this stuff seems, you know, people getting dressed up to go have a, a strega on the cafe just seems like it happened in the 19th century. It doesn't seem like anything modern. But in 1955, 58, it was very modern. The primary social institution in Italy is, anyone? If you're Italian, what's the most important thing to you first? Church. Church. Family. family, family. You're a teenage kid, you're, you, you, know, you may dislike your parents, but you're not gonna move out maybe until you've had your first kid. <laughs> in America, it was like as soon as mom closes her eyes, I'm out the door. You know, give me the keys to the car or get me to New York and I'm out of here, you know. And it's just a different energy. America's a youthful culture. Italy is a, you understand it when you're there. And they say, well, you see this you know, monument of Christendom, St. Peter's Cathedral, is actually built on a Roman cathedral, which is built on an Etruscan cathedral. And we don't know what's under that because every time we dig, the cathedral moves a little. You know, the scene in Fellini's Roma when they go underground to build the subway and they have to stop because they come across a room full of frescoes. There's a hollow space and when they open it up, there are frescoes that have never been seen, not since you know, the, the age of, of the Caesars. And then while they're looking at them, they dissolve because the air from the outside uh, has a chemical, it's a magical scene. Um, this, is, this is the Italian thing. Things come and go, they fade. Um, and it's not a rebellion that moves on, it's time. It's an eternal city, Rome. There's a wonderful scene in Catch-22 when the uh, old man at the brothel um, is talking to Yossarian and Yossarian says, wait, 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 when we were here last time you were wearing like a, 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 a fascist thing and now you're talking about Roosevelt, you know? He says, so? The Italian man says, so? The Germans were here last month, Heil Hitler. You're here today, long live Roosevelt. We, we've been here 3,000 years. You people have to learn which wars you should lose. So the Romans know how to lose a war, you know? Remember, all of this happened in a country that was decimated by World War II, decimated. It was a civil war. There were partisans and fascists warring against each other. And even if there hadn't been a civil war, they were demonstrably on the wrong side. And yet, 15 years after the war, you wanted a Brioni suit or a Valentino dress. You wanted an Alfa Romeo or a Ferrari, an Olivetti typewriter. You would take your trip to the Via Veneto and go see the stars and you know have an espresso. Italian food started coming into the United States. Italian boutique wear, Emilio Pucci. I'm wearing a Pucci knockoff. That's as, 
Got to mention Oregon in every, every talk, and Pucci designed his first clothes right here for the Reed College ski team. In 1937, the same year Mussolini built that movie studio. Um, that's the story that I'm telling in, in the book that I'm working on, how a candle, a, a firework, came up and exploded. And some of the things that come out of it lasted a long time. Valentino was discovered on the Via Veneto, and he had a career that still goes on to this day. He's retired, but the House of Valentino is one of the most powerful fashion houses in the world. Um, Emilio Pucci, designed through his death in the 90s, he went on to become a, uh, an important politician for Florence, representing Pl Florence in the Italian par parliament. Um, some of these movie stars, uh, Marcello Mastroianni and Sophia Loren, the, Italy's two greatest exports you know, that, that weren't built in, in Turin. Um, and then the cars, you know, there's, there's gentlemen race car drivers and, and uh, famous people who wreck themselves behind the wheels of Ferraris practically to this day. Um, so there's glory, but there's no, it's no longer the center. And yet I don't think it matters. I don't think that anyone in Rome can reflect on a period when they had the mojo, when they had the bouncing ball of pop culture nestled right above them, and it went away because they have had so many of these things. Fellini knew it, putting these people in the Trevi Fountain in the Basilica of San Pietro. Um, when you think of uh, La Dolce Vita, um, you could be talking about something that's in, in um, uh, Catullus or Martial or, or, or some other Roman poet writing about the grand meals and the, the celebrities who we need footnotes to identify when we read these poems, but were very well known to anyone in Rome at the time. Um, we have the novelty of cinema, and we can actually see these things, which is remarkable. So I commend to you Roman holiday this afternoon, Dolce Vita. When is it playing? Do we know, Bill? Oh, for Pete's sake, see it anyhow. Get the Blu-ray. And if you haven't seen The Great Beauty, if my talk were to have an epilogue, The Great Beauty, which won the Oscar for Best Foreign Film, Paolo Sorrentino's film, could be the epilogue. What would this look like if it happened now? Um, and his version of the dead fish um, of Wilma Montesi is that cruise ship that turned over on the Livorno coast. <laughs> There's a great shot of of our characters staring at, at the fish. And I guarantee you, you know, we may not realize it at first, but in Italy, something dead on the beach, that's Wilma Montesi. That's like a, you know when someone's late for an appointment and say, oh, it's Amelia Earhart, Judge Crater, some reference to someone who has disappeared and was never found, that's, that's for them, some scrap on the beach. The ignominy of it. I like this image of people on, on a seashore. I think it's intimate, it's historic. This went all over the world, whoever took this shot, you know, Got a, got a fiat out of it. Um, and I, of course, commend to you the clothing upstairs. Um, as I said, imagine every, everything I said, but everyone's beautifully dressed. Um, there's a lot of stuff from this 80s and later out here that's upstairs that's just remarkable, but the stuff from, from the 50s, the, the true great glamour era of the post-war, it tells a story in itself. Thank you very much, and um, I'd like to take some questions. And again, as a reminder, we do have microphones circulating. Um, since the talk is recorded, we, it's great if we can pick up the questions on microphone. Anyone? Here we go. You know, that's a, that's a good question. It's something I'm still tracking down. Um, if you had gone out to a nightclub on the Via Veneto, you would have seen um, jazz, but not like the hip jazz of 1950s. It would have been a slightly older style, even Dixieland. Um, but like uh, the French sort of between the wars style, hot jazz. Um, and there were a couple of songwriters. We all know the most famous song written in Italy at this time, Volare, Nel Blu di Pinto di Blu. That fellow, Domenico Modugno, um, wrote quite a few songs, and he's, 
He never became an international star. There were a couple of Italian early rockers, uh, Little Tony, who went to England, and Adriano Celentano, who um, plays, a, uh, plays a young punk in La Dolce Vita. He's got like one line. But they didn't really have a scene. So if you went out, you would have heard mambos. You would have heard some hot jazz. Um, but, you know, and the Italian singers would be singing. Um, uh, there, there's a song the film The Talented Mr. Ripley. Um, they go to a jazz club. It's set in Italy at this time, and Jude Law is a regular at the jazz club, and Matt Damon, who we know is a great mimic, joins in with him playing, and they sing a song, Tu vuoi fa americano. Um, you want to act like an American, and it's about some guy who thinks he's cool. He a, you, you dance to rock and roll, you play baseball, you drink whiskey, but you're in Naples. Um, and it's, it's like this teasing song, sort of like uh, the King's dedicated follower of fashion, making fun of someone for being too, too hip. Um, but it, you know, again, it was just a hit in Italy. They're, they didn't really have a musical export. Um, and the big music events at this time would have been when Sinatra came to town, Charles Aznavour, pe people who were you know, popular in the European continent. And then, of course, when the Beatles played in Rome two, three years after. Well, and in fact, Eight and a Half in the book will be part of it. Fellini goes on to make an abstract, you know, I'm going to, uh, it's one of my favorite movies, so now I'm going to talk badly about it. It's an abstract, navel-gazing, abstruse movie that really isn't about anything, <laughs> in which the lead character very thinly disguises Federico Fellini down to having the same mistress as Federico Fellini, Sandra Milo, um, at one point looks in a mirror and says, I have nothing to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> that film was shot simultaneously with Cleopatra at Cinecittà and debuted the same year as Cleopatra. And when they gave out the Oscars for best costumes, the color prize, because they used to give out photography, costumes and sets in black and white and color during the changeover, the color prize went to Cleopatra, the black and white went to eight and a half. So eight and a half is part of it. You know, it, it's this, this, um, this Rococo phase where the, the making of the object becomes part of the object. The, 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 um, the, uh, the, the artist's self-awareness becomes part of the theme of the subject. Um, it, you know, it, it's, it's more internal. It's not speaking so much about the culture as the one man. Fellini also made a short film after in between Eight and a Half and La Dolce Vita, he made um, a sequence in the film Boccaccio 70, which has Anita Ekberg um, and censors trying to um, take down a billboard of her advertising milk. <laughs> she's, in this, she's on a billboard with a plunging neckline and basically says, got milk or whatever. And uh, <laughs> this, this you know, very puritanical man has to look at this thing from his apartment all day and he has this nightmare where she's as big as the buildings and she's chasing him around, <laughs> spilling out of her dress. And uh, so, so, you know, when, when, I should mention that La Dolce Vita won the Golden Palm at Cannes. It wasn't nominated by Italy for the Oscar. The film uh, Capo by Gilo Pontecorvo was nominated about the concentration camps. Fair play. Um, and Fellini was already two in a row at that point for foreign film Oscars. And this is something about Oscars people don't realize. The foreign, the Spaniards nominate the Spanish film. The Academy doesn't look at all the films from Spain and pick which film will represent Spain. Spain picks which film. Fair play. But sometimes they don't necessarily go for the big guy. Sometimes they want to draw attention to a new artist or, you know, they have, a, they have an agenda that has nothing to do with the Oscars. And Fellini wasn't nominated for La Dolce Vita. Um, but he was reviled as much as he was celebrated. He got spit on at the premiere in Milan. Um, he had, um, his, his morality was debated on the floor of parliament. Uh, Le Sorvatore Romano, the papal newspaper, had editorial after editorial denouncing him. He finally got to meet with a pope. Um, private audience, and the Pope said, I'll pray for your soul. 
I like this new pope. I, don't, I just don't see him doing that to someone. He seems to like birds and he likes soccer. He just seems like, you know, more fun. Someone else, we have time for a couple more? Yes. Yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's, one, it's still one of the most visited cities in the world. One of the, I mean, you know, it's, it sounds cynical to call it this, but you know, clearly it was an economic scheme in 1949. The then Pope declared 1950 would be a, a papal year, which brought like three million pilgrims to Rome, which boosted the economy. Um, you know, he, he, he lives there, he saw people starving, and he knew that you know, you could do something if you just told people this is a good year to get blessed. Um, and, you know, jet travel starts during this period and um, international tourism, particularly by Americans, because the Italian and American economy and culture have a wonderful, you know, sort of seesaw, not up and down, but it's like simultaneous, like almost going up the ladder together. Um, in the 1950s, America's favorite entertainer, Frank Sinatra, America's favorite athlete, Joe DiMaggio, one of the most popular politicians who was sent to Europe to oversee the Marshall Plan, Fiorello LaGuardia, you know, and, you know, the, the great Italian immigration to the United States of the um, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, had borne fruit in people who could afford to go back and visit. So there was great tourism between the countries. And by the way, a lot of those wonderful clothes made with American cotton. You know, there was some selfishness in the Marshall Plan. We'll sell you the cotton to make these clothes and then we'll buy the clothes from you. Um, just like they did with the movies. So there was always a, tourism was a huge thing. And I, you know, you can complain about Romans being gruff, but they're gruff with a smile. You know, sort of like New Yorkers in that way. They, you know, yeah, they talk rough, but they'll actually show you where you're going and, you know, point you out a good place to eat. Um, and it's always been that way. And pinching. <laughs> yes? Um, was Sinatra involved in the film industry at all? Just, you know, in the U.S. with Frank Sinatra, we had some ties to the mafia and things. Did, was there something similar to that going on? You know, to about the same degree, which is to say not much in either case. I mean, there were people, um, the, the, the mobbed up studio in Hollywood was Columbia. Um, Harry Cohn used to play cards with Johnny Rosselli, who was the uh, Chicago mobs guy in Las Vegas and Los Angeles. And there were a few times when um, Columbia Pictures was actually funded by some mafia money to get them through a rough patch and then um, they, they would do favors. Um, and there were, you know, there's always been suspicions about Dino De Laurentiis because he's from Naples, but that's considered a prejudice. You know, everyone assumes everyone in Naples is mafia, say the Neapolitans. Well, you know, my family's Neapolitan. I'm not, you know, telling anything I don't know. Um, you know, there's a reason people are suspicious of them, because they're all mobbed up. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so yeah, but, but you know, the, the business itself, um, Chinichita was owned by the state, you know, and of course, in, in little things like uh, the services that might go into the movie business, um, building supplies, lumber, things like that. But Chinichita was already the biggest business in Rome, literally. So they didn't have to depend very much on other people. They could cut their own deals. So uh, I haven't come across it. There were the, the big crime scandal of this time was there was an actual outlaw bandit king running around Sicily, Salvatore Giuliano, throughout the 50s and 60s. So I'd be reading through newspapers to, to learn stuff about this, and there would be like, you know, daring holdup in broad daylight in Palermo, you know, and these, these, these mafia chieftains still in the hills, you know, surrounded by guns like the guys in The Godfather. Um, so that was still going on, but not, not so much in this scene. Um, now it's different. Now they're, they're involved in fashion and, and anything moving in and out. But um, back then, you know, Lucky Luciano lived in, in Italy during the 50s after he was deported from the United States. And uh, 
Paparazzi never seemed to want to get a shot of him for some reason. <laughs> Give Lucky his space. We have time for one more. Yes. No? I thought, okay, right here. No. The death of Wilma Montesi was never solved. It's, it's almost certain that she was at some sort of drugs and sex orgy at some uh, count's house, and she was dumped on the beach. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the culture was so um, puritanical that they initially had reported, oh, she accidentally drowned while going to the beach to soak the bunions in her feet in the salt water. No one in her family knew anything about this. And they, they had her like 13 miles up downstream of where she would have been if this had happened. Um, so, you know, the first story was ludicrous. The second story was slightly less ludicrous. The trials went on for a while, and finally the only people who went to jail were people who appeared as helpful witnesses who were perjuring themselves. Um, and the, uh, the, the two guys who were probably at the heart of the case got off scot-free. There's, a, there's a, a whole library of books on the Montesi case. It's you know, one of the great unsolved murders in Italy and so sensational. Um, it's uh, you know, sort of like, a, like the Manson family almost. You, know, you go into a true crime library and you find 20, 30 books. There are books, there were two books in English at the time, uh, one with the delightful title, All Rome Trembled. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, enjoy the close. <laughs>